Welcome to Commotion Labs Fundamentals for Startups. I'm Ashley Espan, Senior Manager with Commotion Labs. While we wait for everyone to log in, I'll make a few announcements. Next week, Scott Allenbaugh and Justin Dunnicliffe with the National Security Innovation Network of the U.S. Department of Defense will present DOD as a customer, an introduction to the U.S. Department of Defense. All of our fundamentals for startup presentations are archived on our Commotion website under the innovation training videos. We have covered a variety of topics over the past several years, so if you find yourself with some free time, check out our past talks. For a full schedule and to register for future fundamentals, please visit our bit.ly commotion fundamentals. Um, they'll drop a link in the um, chat and turn on the bell for notifications. Fundamentals for Startups is founded, funded in part by a grant from the Economic Development Agency. We will be dropping another link in the chat to, of a short survey. Please tell us who you are, where you're watching, and how you heard about this event. This will help us report back to continue the funding. This year, we are proud to partner with Bluetooth to support the Fundamentals for Startups program. See how Bluetooth audio sharing is poised to once again change the way you will experience audio and connect with the world around you. Bluetooth introduced the world to wireless audio. Calling, listening, watching making us safer, more productive, more joyful. It's part of the fabric of our lives. Now, Bluetooth will bring us even closer to each other and our world with audio sharing. It will let us share with others music, our experiences, listening and watching together. The places we go will share with us, enriching our experiences, helping us hear our world. Breaking down barriers between interests, cultures, generations. Introducing Bluetooth audio sharing. Closer. Together. Today, Cassie Benford and Matt Medlin are here to present a roadmap to scale financial reporting. Cassie and Matt are CPAs and leaders of Clark Newber's team, serving pre-seed, angel, and venture-backed companies in SaaS, AR, VR gaming, AI, ML, telecom, product innovation, blockchain, and health sciences. Their team helps startup and emerging growth companies establish sound business, tax financial reporting, and data security practice systems to enhance their ability to raise funds, attract customers, and develop their team. Cassie and Matt will take questions via the chat, so feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. I'll now turn it over to Cassie and Matt. Well, welcome everybody to Roadmap to Scale Financial Reporting. Before we start, I would like to tell a brief story. Show me the money. Isn't that what all founders want? So just this past year, we were introduced to a company whose product had really taken off and their revenue had quadrupled in just three years. It was very impressive. And now they had the opportunity to go public. The problem was they had already outgrown their financial reporting capabilities and this cost them real money. First off, their audit fees were triple what they should have been because their records were not clean. And the errors that were found in revenue caused their valuation to drop, which spooked the market and resulted in 15% less capital raise than expected. We we're all very bummed about this. So today we are going to make sure this does not happen to any of you. My name is Kathy Binford and this is my colleague, Matt Medlin. We are CPAs and advisors to emerging companies. We work with companies from pre-revenue stage all the way through to going public. Today we'll discuss key financial reporting requirements for pre-revenue companies to help founders raise money and avoid costly mistakes. Our presentation will be about 40 minutes, minutes long and then we'll leave some time for questions at the end. But as questions come up throughout, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them 
as we go. And by the time you're done, you will learn what to look out for from a financial reporting perspective when starting a company so that you can get your business off to a great start and save time and money later on. So specifically, what are we gonna to cover today? Well, let's take a look. So the majority of our presentation will focus on companies that are just starting out. So companies still kind of in that pre-revenue phase. Um, and these topics will be items that new founders should probably have on their radar and start to build out. And then we'll spend a little bit of time for topics that will be focused on later stage companies. And the goal of this part of the presentation will just to be so that you know they exist in case an investor or a partner happened to ask about them. So I will pass it off to Matt, who will talk about our first topic, system setup. Thanks, Cassie. And I also want to really thank, again, Comotion Labs and Bluetooth, their sponsor. We're, we're thrilled to be here and really have appreciated this program over the years. Uh, two great organizations, both here in town, and uh, it's a lot of fun working with you. Um, so first off, what is system setup? And if you're an early stage company and you're just a whiteboard and some ideas, you don't need to do any of this. But once money starts happening, then you need to really start keeping track of it. And it's a little bit tedious and a little bit mundane, but early uh, hygiene, uh, it will save you a lot of time later and uh, make things go a lot smoother. So, so really the first thing to do is find an accounting system. There are a couple of good, good ones out there for very early stage companies. Uh, QuickBooks is quite common, another, another uh, system called Xero. And that really, they really just keep track of where your money's been spent and, and what money you have and who you owe to if you've got credit cards or uh, potential investors or whatever. Another key one, which isn't quite as intuitive, but I really encourage founders to focus on, is a document management system. And that would be either Box or Dropbox or Google Docs. It doesn't really matter. Something I think cloud-based makes sense because that way there's backup and uh, and it's easy to provide other people access because as you grow and build, there'll be lots of folks who'll be interested in learning more and you can allocate portions of that for potential investors or advisors or whomever. Um, uh, so why do you wanna do that? And before I get into this, if you could help us out a little bit on who we have attending today, drop into the chat. There's a little delay, but the producers will compile it. Uh, let us know if you're a student uh, or a professor or a founder of a business, uh, an advisor to a business like Cassie and I, or maybe an investor. And if you're an investor, we won't leak your name to anybody, but uh, I, I know there's always some great companies here to, to keep an eye on. So drop that in the chat and uh, we'll hear what the results of that are in a few minutes. Um, so, so why do you want to uh, set up a system like this? Uh, really to, to keep track of where the money is. Uh, and as Cassie mentioned in the first slide and Tom Cruise taught us well a number of years ago, you, you gotta keep track of the money and you also need to keep track of your documents and, and your signed documents and uh, uh, are super important. So, you know, how do, how do I do this? Um, you know, basically try to get into and keep track of your, your cash uh, and, and spending at least monthly, a little more often is better, but you don't want it to overrun you. I mean, as a founder, your primary focuses are figuring out the idea, really talking to your potential customers and understanding that, and, and starting to build the team. And those are the key things. This is something else that needs to occur often on nights and weekends. So don't let it consume you, but don't don't ignore it entirely either. So uh, do do keep track of things as they occur. And as you get those final executed documents, whether it's a R&D arrangement, a grant, a lease, uh, an a employment contract with someone uh, else, uh, make sure those are all kept in, in your uh, filing system that you set up. Um, so, so the next uh, topic I wanna turn to is um, just reconciling what you got. And I think, you know, uh, everybody in this room has has 
either regularly reconciles their own personal bank account or wishes they did, or has decided to entirely ignore it. But but most of us don't have enough money that we have that kind of a cushion. So uh, it's pretty common that um, a, an early stage company will have some credit cards, a checking account, probably not a whole lot more than that. Um, but uh, but those are important. I do want to highlight, um, and one of the one of the groups that's uh, involved with Comotion Labs too is the industry organization in town supporting the technology industry called the Washington Technology Industry Association. Uh, it's easy to join there as a as a new company member. They have some great programs for things like credit cards, uh, banking relationships, and and stuff like that. But in any case, you're going to have a credit card or two. Um, and a bank account, doing those monthly reconciliations is super helpful. Why? Because again, cash is really important and, uh, and you wanna know what you've been spending and how much money you have left. When am I gonna need to raise money? Can I meet my bills as they come due? It's, it's that sort of burden that uh, is called, is the sweat equity part that we all talk about and, uh, and super important. So really knowing where your cash is, getting a feel for how that's going to be spent and, um, and how, uh, and then really where do I want to spend it on? Do I want to maybe hire a salesperson? Do I fo want to focus on development? Do I want to buy lab equipment? You know, where, where am I going to spend my money? And so uh, these accounting tools I mentioned, all of the banks have good feeds that electronically transfer information from um, the bank into your accounting system. Get those set up. Again, it's a little tedious to begin with. They break sometimes, but, but it's a good way to really keep track of what's going on. And, uh, and then every month, and do, I really encourage this discipline, make sure it all adds up correctly and you get all your spending in the right place. Um, as Cassie mentioned, we spent uh, six months getting a company caught up on this, and they were only a couple of years behind, but it took six months of kind of outside effort that wasn't necessarily cheap to get organized. And that was after the founder had just gotten really frustrated with the fact that she didn't really know where the money was being spent because the accounting records weren't in good shape, and, and therefore she didn't know where to go next. Now, once things got synced up and, and tied down, it was it was much easier to project. It made the investors that were new and coming in much more comfortable and really worked out well. So um, I think that's, you know, again, those month that monthly discipline is really important. Um, I'm wondering if if the producers, if we've seen any demographics come in on uh, uh, kind of who's in the audience. Matt. It looks like we have about uh, a majority are uh, founders. So about six or seven of uh, those people are founders. We have a few students, um, we have a consultant. So yeah, that's kind of the audience right now and a oh, couple of staff members, yeah. Oh, good, okay, well, that's that's great. Um, and thanks for that. Uh, so, um, so and, and, and so it's good there's founders in the room. If they're students, they're future founders. And if they're consultants, they may be founders as well uh, one day. Um, and, and that is really the, the core ecosystem that you know, really provides energy to, to our practice and, and is why we do what we do to help you all do what you want to do and handling these, um, these, these kind of regular tasks. So the next area that, that you'll jump into is raising money. And um, uh, and starting to bring on investors through lots of different ways. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Cassie, and she'll talk about how to keep track of that. Right. So yeah, what is a cap table exactly? Well, it's where you want to track all of your equity and your financing activity. So things like fundraising rounds, your convertible notes, warrants, stock options really anything that you're raising money and also changing the ownership of the company. And this should be pretty detailed. Like we talked about earlier, show me the money. So you'll wanna track the dollars, how much money you're raising, uh, the number and the types of shares, investor information, terms, dates, vesting schedules, really the more detailed, the better, and it'll definitely uh, help you later. Um, another part of keeping track of your cap table is keeping track of all of those underlying documents. So Matt mentioned setting up um, a storage system to kind of keep track of 
signed, executed documents, and this is part of it. So keeping track of purchase agreements, options, plans, uh, promissory notes, all of those types of things. And when you're gathering them, you want to make sure they're fully executed and you've got all of the exhibits. And this seems easy, but it can get out of hand uh, very quickly. We've seen a lot of founders kind of scramble around looking for these types of documents during an audit, and that's it's not where you want to be. So just make sure you keep them organized from the start. Uh, so you can be more organized for an audit or if you're going through due diligence or trying to raise money. I think it's good to have them all right there for you. So it's important to start uh, organizing these things early on just so you have all this information kind of at your at your fingertips because everyone is going to ask you for it. Investors, attorneys, partners, they want to know kind of what they're getting into if they decide to join in this venture with you because it can impact their ownership share and that's where they'll they'll find that out and it can definitely influence their decision some people don't want you know too many cooks in the kitchen so um, just having that information available for them is really important and then the other piece of it is protection for your company and yourself so if there's any future shareholder disputes or claims, you want to have this information readily available so you can more efficiently and effectively kind of close out these types of issues and get back to the important things like running the actual business, uh, building revenue, that kind of a thing. So there's lots of different ways to keep track of this. Um, anything from Excel to more sophisticated systems, we see a lot of companies use Carta, C-A-R-T-A, -A, um, which works really well. And the, any system is really useful. And in time, it'll start calculating your stock option expense and give you all your disclosure information. But for like brand new companies, Excel is totally fine. Kind of when you get to that first round of funding or you're starting an option plan, that's when you want to start thinking about uh, getting a system. And it'll definitely be worth money. Uh, you can also utilize your attorney or your corporate counsel. They're already helping you keep track of some of these legal documents anyway, so you can kind of lean on them to a certain extent. Um, they can also help you review the cap table once you've organized it, make sure it's accurate, and make sure you're not missing anything. So that kind of covers uh, cap table organization. Now we'll move to bill, pay, and subledger system. Sounds a little bit more boring, but if you do it right and you do it early on, you won't have to think about it again. So what exactly does this mean? Well, there's different transaction cycles in the financial statements and they all kind of sync up to the main accounting system. So I'll go through three different um, common examples of this. The first is bill pay. So this is where you would get all of your invoices that vendors would send you that you'll have to pay. You can put them in this bill pay system and it'll keep track of them. It'll send it through for the appropriate appro approvals via email. Um, and then it'll connect to your bank, pay your vendors. And then the best part is it'll sync up to your uh, general ledger, your main accounting system and record all of those expenses. So there's no manual entry for you, which is really nice. Another really common one is payroll. So you wanna make sure your employees are getting paid, you wanna make sure their payroll taxes are correct. Um, and then these systems will also do direct deposit to your employees' bank accounts. And then depending on the bundle or the system that you get, they might also have a platform where your employees can actually view their paycheck and see what's being deducted and what kind of what's going on with that. And then sometimes it will also have an HR bundle attached to it where you can keep track of uh, hiring information, um, term dates, offer letters, those types of things. And then the last example to go through is the revenue and billing system. And this will be a little bit later stage, um, but it is important. And it's where you'll put in all of your customer information, your customer contracts, you'll put in the um, payment information for customers, and then it'll automatically, again, sync up with your GL system, record all those cash payments, all that revenue without you having to do uh, too much. So really useful. 
Uh, so why would you want to get started on this so early? Well, it's really going to simplify your accounting and save you time and money, especially on the payroll. So it'll be really useful in calculating all those payroll taxes and it'll help your employees kind of at the end of the year too when they're filing their, their year end taxes. You don't want their paychecks to be, to be messed up. So it's good to get a system so that it doesn't get too overly complicated. Uh, the other piece of it is just ease of information. Since it all automatically syncs up with your accounting system and there's no manual entry, you'll have all of this information in real time. So when investors ask you for, you know, how are you doing this month or this year, you'll be able to easily pull a report from your accounting system and provide that to them. You know, there's not going to be a huge delay and that will be a really good signal to the investor that, you know, you've got it together. Uh, it also help you with making faster business decisions because you'll have all this information. You'll know how much you've spent on marketing or sales or development, and you can kind of take a, a good look at it, you know, mid-year and see if there's any mid-year pivots that you need to make or allocate money differently, you know, for the last half of the year. So it'll really help with making those um, real-time business decisions. There's lots of different systems to choose from. We listed a few examples on the slide there that we've seen different companies use. But really the most important thing is making sure it's compatible with whatever accounting system you're using so that you get that sync up um, seamlessly. So that covers the subledgers and their systems. And I'll pass it to Matt, who will talk about management accounting. Thanks, Cassie. And uh, it, I suspect if you're a, a founder now in, in the early stages, you might be a little either breathless because you're trying to write all this down and how do I keep track of all this and how do I decide which system to get, um, or you've given up entirely or you've maybe got it locked down, but probably more toward the beginning. And one thing I'd really emphasize, one of the great parts about CoMotion's program is they, they bring on folks who talk about all these different areas. Just a couple of weeks ago, Shannon Swift uh, was here talking about HR and payroll and managing that whole area, which touches on some of what Cassie was getting to. There's some really good advisors in town that can really help you set up these initial accounting systems and get that going. And you're you're wanting to save money and you don't want to spend it on, you know, unnecessarily and you want to focus on the product and the customers and the team, but a little bit of investment. Uh, the, the advisors in this ecosystem understand that and they're they they price it accordingly and they and they want to make things a little easier on the early stage companies. So really, really think about using those advisors. I uh, uh, invested in a Techstars company three or four years ago. Uh, that came out of uh, the UW here, and um, I remember the the CEO called me one day and said, "Hey, I'm trying to work through this B&O tax issue with one of the cities in town, and you know, can you help me think through it?" As an investor, I was happy to kind of help him a little bit, and but I knew he was using a good accounting advisor uh, to to do his day to day and month to month bookkeeping. I said, "Why aren't you getting their help?" He said, "Well, I you know I I kind of want to keep you know, a tight budget and." And I said, dude, you got to like do what you do and let them do what they do. And uh, I think he eventually listened to me, but but fast forward a little bit. He just closed a thirty five million dollar round about a week and a half ago. And they're on the front page of all the industry publications that they want to be on the front page of. And they're really rocking it. So uh, he used his advisors and did what he did and things are going OK. So hang in there. No, it's a little bit. Um, overwhelming sometimes, but get help because uh, there's some good help out there. So so management accounting, um, you know, again, it's all about kind of knowing where to spend the where to spend your time and where to spend your money. And so forecasting um, uh, how much cash we have left, how much do we need to raise? What are we going to do with it? Sometimes you do get some money coming in from uh, maybe a demo project somebody's willing to pay a little bit for, maybe there's a grant you're able to get through all sorts of different ways. Uh, but, 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 but really knowing how much I have left, what 
in, we don't want detailed budgets. You know, you're not Boeing or something like that where it needs to be super precise, but a good feel for, am I going to be able to pay the rent at the end of the month? I've got two employees. Am I going to be able to pay them? Um, uh, maybe even pay yourself a check so you can pay your own rent, those sorts of things. So it's, it's, so management accounting is important. You also get into, I use the term unit costing here, which is how much is it going to cost to deliver my product uh, kind of on a one for one basis. So if I'm making a, a tool, you know, how much will that cost if I'm a SaaS company, you know, what am I going to be paying in AWS fees or, or uh, uh, Microsoft fees for the this web services and in how much, you know, it, it helps you in the pricing and helps you in talking with customers on what, what the economics are. And then also management accounting includes looping in with your sales pipeline and what are those future customers? How are they, where are we on identifying contacts? Where are we on moving them forward through the sales pipeline down to closing a deal and getting them into the system for billing? So, you know, why do you want to do all this? Um, a lot of it is you're starting as you as you gain traction. The good news is you're gaining traction. People are interested. The, the, sometimes the bad news is people are maybe too interested than you'd prefer. You might have a board. You're, you may have employees want to know how things are going. Am I going to get paid? You know, I'm at a startup. I'm not at Amazon. I'm, you know, I'm payroll going to clear this month. Um, and uh, uh, and also when you're fundraising, being Agile with this information is super important. We work with a number of venture firms and angel groups, and where I've seen companies really take a great product and a great team in its very early stages and, and rock and early financing is when they also have their house in order on this stuff. And I've seen it go off the rails with a super cool product, a great team, but they couldn't quite put their hands on the signed document. They the, the numbers didn't quite make sense when somebody poked just a little bit. And I've seen deals fall apart during due diligence where they're trying to raise their first round of equity and they just can't get it done because they, they haven't handled this. So, you know, how do I do it? Again, you know, have an accounting advisor. Maybe it's an internal person. Maybe it's a friend that, that uh, is doing this for, for uh, you know, uh, uh, to help you out or or you've hired an advisor but um but but it's the founder working with their their financial folks to really think through what's it going to cost to do this how much i need to spend on dev how much do i need to spend on sales and marketing do i need to uh start doing uh uh projects you know, um you know finding somebody to manufacture whatever i'm making uh or you know whatever it kind of are the different processes that go into getting your product to your customer is uh, is really the key there. I, I One more shout out to um, a, a terrific guy in town. I know he's presented here, Dave Parker. Grab his blog and take a look at that because he posts things in there a lot on these different topics as well and, and is a super helpful uh, resource and a, a terrific person too. So with that, let me flip over to uh, income taxes, which you may think I'm a startup, I'm losing money, I don't need to pay income taxes. And that is actually true uh, for the most part. Um, but there's actually some ways to use the federal income tax system to generate money for you. Uh, and also you want to start the process of getting things on file Again, for discipline purposes, for future investors who are going to want to ask for your tax returns, even though you've lost money, and um, uh, and it's really important. So, you know, one of the whys to do it is just following the rules and being a good citizen and, and resident here. The other why is you can generate real cash from credits available, even though you've never paid income tax. For example, there's an R&D credit. So if you're doing development work, building a system, building a game research in a lab for medical purposes, a lot, a pretty broad array of things, they, the U.S. government will give you a tax credit that you can use to offset payroll taxes. So if you also have payroll that you're making and paying people Social Security tax, which is a, a six, eight percent a month, um, 
they'll give you that, they'll let you use a credit and you don't need to pay that, which is a nice savings. It's not huge, but every little bit adds up and you definitely want to make use of that. Also through the stimulus programs that the government put in place um, around the pandemic, there's some other nice tax credits available. So having a good tax advisor um, is, is really important. Somebody who understands emerging companies and can talk the talk, they'll be able to have an easy flowing conversation with you and walk you through a, a lot of these questions and make sure you're doing what you can to really maximize your cash position comply with the law, make sure you're not getting uh, behind on your tax obligations and getting the uh, filings in place that you really need. Um, we had uh, one company, um, unfortunately, we got involved quite late on. They were a little further down the road. They unfortunately had an internal accountant who uh, was choosing the ostrich head in the sand approach because one day their bank account, um, they went to write a check and the bank or the actually the bank called the founder and said hey we've needed to freeze your bank account because the state of indiana by the way where we're headquartered uh thinks you owe them a bunch of sales taxes and they've been you know and, and as it turned out the internal accounting person didn't really know what to do with these notices from the state of indiana so putting them in a drawer seemed like the right solution it wasn't. And the state went all the way through a lot of notices with red letters and yellow highlighting and different colored envelopes to basically freezing their bank account, which is a problem and was a problem before that. And it took them a fair amount to dig out of. They were able to do it finally, but, but because of the fact they had some um, other businesses that they could, they could uh, work with. So this discipline early on um, and having, you know, again, good folks helping you with it so that you don't over-engineer it. You wanna do these things, you wanna do them in, a, in the right level of focus so that you're not wasting time doing things you don't need to do, but also you're doing what you do need to do and not getting yourself too far um, behind the eight ball on it. As revenue starts coming in, um, and, and we were sort of focused on pre-revenue for most of this conversation, but as revenue starts coming in, whether, like I said, it's a demo contract or um, a, a, a grant or something like that, Washington State, as most of you know, doesn't have an income tax, which is nice, um, but it does have what's called the business and occupancy tax or the B&O tax, and that's on revenue. And so if you're a company losing money but billing and generating revenue, you need to pay some tax to the city of Seattle and to the state. And if you're in Bellevue, they have a different tax. And if you're in Kenmore, they have a different tax. But if you're in you know, Friday Harbor, they don't have one of those. And so it all depends on where you're doing the business. And that starts to get even more complicated and can truly be overwhelming. I help a couple of family businesses, just personal friends, and it's daunting. And I happen to have folks I can call and get a quick answer to it. But to try to do that research yourself is really painful. So get some help. Um, uh, find find a good um, a, a good advisor on this stuff. And and talk to your founder friends too. They'll have learned some stories and have some ideas. But but make sure you're working with a professional on this. So um, with that, I'm going to kick it over to Cassie, and she'll talk about some next steps. So we've covered a lot of items relevant to early stage companies thus far. So now we'll just touch on a couple of items to focus on once you get into that later stage um, time frame. So you're a real company now. Maybe you've got employees. Maybe you just went through your first um, uh, fundraising, fundraising raise. So what should you focus on now? Well, the most important thing is probably revenue. So just making sure that you understand what your revenue model is actually when a founder asks you. So do you have a subscription model? Do you pay per use? You know, what's the time commitment for your customers? So just kind of how you make money when your customers pay you. And then how does all that line up to how is it reported in the financial statements under, under GAAP? So keeping these things in mind, thinking about these things, especially when you're going into kind of forecasting out or modeling your future financial statements, 
when you're getting them ready to show investors or when you're trying to figure out how much money you're going to need to raise for the next 18 months or so. You want to make sure you have a good understanding of your revenue model and the cash coming in in order to do these types of things. And the next item is international operations. So it's very common for companies to go international uh, pretty early on these days. And this requires uh, different expertise. So expertise in those particular countries that you're going to do business in, especially around their different regulations and their tax regulations is the most important piece of it. Uh, so this requires getting a really good international tax advisor before making any big moves. Uh, this can be a really big topic of conversation during any diligence process um, or making any kind of exit. Everybody needs to know and wants to know if there's any outstanding tax liabilities that the company is going to be responsible for later on and if that should be taken into account during the, the diligence process and the purchase price. And the last item we'll touch on here is just requests for financial information from outside people. So you're growing a lot and that means more requests, which is a really good thing, but it does mean that you'll probably have to produce some gap financial statements. So investors and banks will typically ask for internal financial statements about quarterly, and then they might require an annual report um, that's in accordance with gap. Uh, sometimes customers will ask for internal financials just to get a general sense of how the company is doing. They're going to implement some new products and want to make sure the products will be around in the next year. So they just like to get a general sense of the financial health of the company. So to get a good handle on this and be prepared for all of these requests that will be coming in, it's good to just have a, a relationship with a CPA that can help you take just some baby steps along the way so that when this does happen and when the, when you hit this, this milestone, it won't be such a headache to kind of get ready for it because you'll already have made a lot of steps um, towards, towards this goal. So we've covered a lot of information, been together about 35 minutes now. So let's hear from you. What questions or thoughts do you all have? Um, I'll just start off and um, ask, do you, the types of things to focus on um, in the early stages change depending on the type of industry that a startup is in? Um, I can take that one. Uh, they do. Um, you know, if, if, if you're in, like, let's say medical uh, biosciences of some sort, one of the things that happens early on is uh, you might want to start getting grants from the NIH or other organizations. Um, and uh, but on the other hand, let's say if you're uh, developing a new game, um, you don't you're not going to get grants from the NIH for that. But there are uh, starting to build relationships with the potential platforms, whether it's um, Twitch or the others, to uh, uh, have um, uh, a, you know a, that that sort of channel for your product so absolutely industry has an impact and, and each one is a little different and if a company were to pick one or two of these things to focus on which should they choose well i think the key thing is really the the bottom at, at the end of the day really keeping track of your cash and also your obligations, so your contracts and your cash. You know that I would I would say keep those two in mind. Again, from a housekeeping standpoint, you know, from a building business standpoint, your customers keep them in mind and your team. Um, but when you're thinking about inside the company, cash and and contracts are the ones from a compliance perspective. Um, this question comes from the YouTube. Um, do you recommend any business banks? Um, there are a number in town, uh, and um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to name one or two because there's probably six that are all good. Uh, do focus on um, what they their focus on emerging companies and ask those questions. Uh, ask around a little bit. There are you know three or four or five that are pretty prevalent in the space. Um, and so, but I would encourage you to do that. When you first start out, walk around the corner, the branch on the corner is fine. 
but um, uh, once you start thinking about bringing on investors or get you know moving past just you know writing a few checks and and paying a few expenses, definitely having a business bank focused on emerging technology companies is important. Um, and what is the most common issue that comes up with exits? Well, I, I keep talking, I'll, Cassie, you'll take one in a minute, but, but with this one, I, um, uh, the, um, the, the biggest thing that comes up is the product's not working right and, uh, and those sorts of things. So, but I, I think probably the question was, um, uh, the question was geared toward uh, on the things we've talked about. And one of the big issues that we see a lot, and it sounds really boring and mundane, but is sales tax. Because every state, depending on where you're shipping things to, wants their chunk of sales tax. And that can turn into a big issue. The other is not having all the contracts lined up correctly. And I saw a deal fall apart because the uh, admin team at the company just could not get, you know, the current executed version of a customer contract or, you know, a, a warrant that they had issued or a note payable they had issued. They were fumbling around with it and ending up with drafts and all that. So uh, those are those are two on the compliance side that you see a lot. Uh, this one comes from our in-person um, group. How do cap table platforms like Canva account for option pools when you're looking at ownership? Do founders need an advisor to understand their equity position when option pools get big or is it pretty straightforward? I think with cap tables, you're usually when you get to that point, you've got an attorney who's helping you and um, uh, and they can guide you enough on it. The, the, the tools themselves are actually, they have little models built into them where you can, you know, uh, uh, test out, hey, if I raise this amount of money this way, what would that do to the existing investors? What would that do to me as the founder and those sorts of things? So, you know, an advisor can be helpful, but I've found most founders, it's relatively intuitive, but, but then maybe running it by your attorney and making sure that you didn't forget about something in the, in the arrangements that you've got with your other investors is a good idea. Awesome. Cassie, anything to add to that, or I think that you folks um, actually, or yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, the systems that are in place are super helpful, and like Matt said, you can model out different uh, scenarios. So just it's um it's really useful to have a system in place. Awesome. It looks like we you folks probably covered everything for the people watching. We have a pretty big audience and no further questions. Is there anything that either of you want to add to our presentation? Oh, there's something. Right, yeah. So if there are no more questions, we'll just wrap up our portion of the presentation. We've covered a lot of topics today and it'll be a bit of a challenge to implement all of them. But I think with these tools and all of this information, you guys have a great opportunity to get your business off to a really good start. So, and, and I guarantee you, you'll thank yourself later. So thanks so much for all your time today. And thank both of you for coming and presenting. And so for everybody else, that's all for today, I suppose. Um, thank you all for joining us. And a big thank you to Cassie and Matt for sharing their wisdom with our group. Um, and as a reminder, next Friday at noon, we'll be hearing from Scott Allenbaugh and Justin Dunnicliffe, who will present on DOD as a customer, an introduction to the U.S. Department of Defense. So sign up for that, and then we'll see you all next week. <laughs>